All right, so the name of this title is on the, on the uh, screens. This, uh, this sermon is called King Priesting and Profiteering for Hearth and Country. And it, uh, my wife tells me that seems like, oops, sort of an odd title. Um, I didn't think it was so odd, but then, you know, I, uh, I'm told that I frequently don't think things are odd that are. Uh, but oddly enough, it's quicker to say than what it represents, right? All the words in that are, are uh, chosen in a particular, for a particular reason and so forth. Uh, because it's, it's about what Christians are and how that relates to this last talk. Because this is the last talk in a series on fathers and husbands and, you know, manhood, that other gender. Uh, I believe God orders history, and he puts it in order, including yours and mine, in ways that take into account our motivations, our desires and choices, and that you and I are here because, well, we're supposed to be. I know some of you are probably here because, well, heck, uh, you know, it's close to the holidays and I had to be out of town with my people anyway, or... or uh, or maybe your wife said, oh, come on, please, let's go, even though you hate the church or something. But, you know, but you're here. And whatever reason that is, uh, you should know that not only myself, but a number of people in this church pray for these services so that the people will come uh, who God wants to come. So, uh, Ali Ali awesome free. And I prayed long and hard um, to give you a message. And I was reminded of the fact that Proverbs 16.33 says, The lot is cast into the lap, but its every decision is from the Lord. So, welcome to where we're all supposed to be. I took that all into account. I prayed and meditated long on this fact, asking God to give me something for y'all, even for those of you in Netlandia, in cyberspace, if you're seeing this later, whether you're male or not. So here it comes, gird up your loins. He who has ears to hear, uh, you know, or her, as the case may be, listen. So anytime you're talking about something, it's always helpful, but very helpful to go to the place where things begin. So we're going to go to Genesis 1, 26 through 28 which uh, hopefully will be coming up on the screens. There it is. Then God said, Let us make man in our image, according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Then God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it have dominion over the uh, fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. So the triune creator here in this passage, from sheer graciousness, uh, determined to make mankind, male and female, in his image, according to his likeness, as it says, an image like him uh, in ways, but not, of course, God, but like him on a created level. And this, of course, means lots of things, right? I could spend probably years ultimately talking about that, but, but one of those things is that he wanted us to have dominion, it says, to have a rule under God over the earth and over its animals and other inhabitants uh, to subdue it, as it says in verse 28. Fair enough, fair enough. But what the heck does that mean? Right? Um, how do we come to subdue and have dominion over the earth and its creatures? Well, I would reckon that God knew we were going to ask this question. Um, and he providentially arranged history and the life of Adam and Eve and his scriptures to help answer that. Uh, because if we turn to Genesis 2.15, we see that it says this. Then the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to tend and keep it. Um, 
this short verse tells us quite a bit about the task of dominion that God designed us for and what manner of subduing things God had in mind. Eden's garden was originally intended to spread across the globe to expand outward over the earth, transforming the planet into a garden temple. And how was this to happen? Mankind, uh, like our first father Adam, was to tend it and keep it. Well, that seems sort of anticlimactic, right? Uh, but hold on a minute. Let's look a little more closely at these two terms, to tend and to keep it, uh, as to what they mean more fully in the original languages written in Hebrew. The first term translated tend in the New King James Version, which is what's on the screens, is the Hebrew word avat, which does mean tend, but it also means cultivate, work, dress, labor, or do work but especially as a call infinitive, which if you don't know Hebrew, you won't care about that, but especially it means to work for another, to serve another, and in point of fact, it's one of the words that was used uh, in Hebrew for slaving, in other words, for slavery. Um, now why in the world, well, literally in this case, why in the world would God assign a task associated with slavery to define part of humanity's task of dominion because authority when it's given by God is meant to serve those things over which authority is given Jesus the new Adam and we know he's the new Adam because it says so in Romans 5 14 and 1 Corinthians 15 45 through 49 Jesus the new Adam modeled and taught this form of authority and dominion when he said in Mark chapter 10 Verses 42, he said, Jesus called them over and said to them, you know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles dominate them, and their men of high positions exercise power over them. But it must not be like that among y'all. On the contrary, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first among you must be a slave to all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. So here's the Lord Jesus himself teaching that rulers, himself included, despite the fact that as uh, we're told in scripture, he's King of Kings and Lord of Lords, and uh, that he says later on, all authority in heaven and earth uh, belongs to me, as it says in Matthew 20 and 18, Here's Jesus saying rulers are to be servants and slaves to all. This is one aspect of godly dominion. Giving yourself and all you are to serve that which you rule over. To cause it to grow and to develop as it's supposed to grow and develop. To glorify it in the language of scripture. At your own expense of time, life, and preference. Just like Jesus did for us. That's also uh, what Adam was called and designed to do, to dedicate himself as a servant, a slave to the purpose of tending and developing and glorifying the world. Now, to keep, the Hebrew word translated as keep, tend and keep it, uh, is, is shamar, which means, uh, besides keep, it also means to have charge over something, to watch over it, and especially to guard or protect something. Adam's job of keeping was more accurately and fully a job of guarding and protecting the garden, which was a temple and the place of the two sacramental trees, the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Adam was supposed to watch the boundaries and all that was inside, Eden's boundaries to protect it and to keep it from becoming something it was not supposed to be. It was supposed to be a garden, not the wilderness outside the garden, right? Uh, outside of Eden. Adam, however, if you know the story, he didn't do a good job of this. When it came to Eve and the serpent dragon, 
When the servant was lying to her, he should have interrupted, pulled her away, and refuted Satan. But he didn't, even though, as Scripture tells us in Genesis 3, 6, he was with her. So he said and did nothing, uh, a failure that led to the fall. The second Adam, the Lord Jesus, though, did defend the boundaries. Uh, for instance, of uh, the limits of what was right and wrong and should be when he overturned the money changers' uh, price gouging tables and he ran them out with a whip, which he did twice, according to Matthew 21, 12 through 13 and John 2, 13 through 17. And his disciples understood what Jesus did at that time as being motivated by Psalm 69, 9, which says, zeal for your house has consumed me or has eaten me up, right? Jesus acted to protect and guard the sanctity uh, and the function of part of God's house, the court of the Gentiles, which was hijacked for profit by money changers. Jesus also guarded the boundaries and borders of God's kingdom by warning his followers not to heed, not to pay attention to, but to beware the leaven of the teaching of the Pharisees' legalism in Matthew 16, 6 through 12. This function of Adam and Jesus and all mankind is precisely uh, that, part of the, of the uh, dominion calling. This is a part of dominion. Now, normally folks, theologians, would say that the job of ruling, right, is his basilic, his kingly task. And the job of guarding stuff is called the hieratic task, uh, task, which is the priestly task. So what you see in Genesis 2.15 is a picture of Adam as what he's supposed to be, a priest and a king over the garden and ultimately over the earth. Right? So um, Adam and humanity's job in dominion is a kingly servanthood the dedication to developing and promoting and growing the world to be what it should be, and a priestly responsibility to guard and protect it against things that it should not be. It's sort of a balance, you see. But how do we find that balance? Hmm. Hmm. So, and let me just say that now you get the king priesting part of the sermon title. King priesting is developing and guarding the world, serving and guarding the world. But what about the profiteering part? Well, before we go to that, let's talk a little bit about the answer to how we find the balance of king priesting. We act as, hang on, I know this is going to surprise you, prophets. So we speak and act in terms of God's word. God's word tells us what the purpose of things are and how they should be developed. God's word tells us what things should not be and what needs to be guarded against. Adam did relay God's commands about not eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil to Eve, although she didn't, either she didn't quite remember it right or he didn't exactly tell her correctly as Genesis 2, 16 through 17 and 3, 1 through 3 tells us. But saliently, neither Adam nor Eve heeded God's word in the clinch and we all died for it. Oh yes, Adam, our genocidal first father, the murderer of humankind spiritually. Jesus, however, did heed God's word as he faithfully obeyed God's will in being sent to redeem us on the cross. And he explicitly says so in John 17, 4 through 6. Lord, you've sent me. I have accomplished your will. I have done what you commanded me to do. He obeyed the scriptures like with the donkey's coat, which I talked about some weeks ago in Matthew 21, 1 through 7. He was fulfilling a passage of scripture, Zechariah 9, 9, when he did that. And he was constantly speaking God's word to those who came to hear it and those who didn't want to as well, as we've talked about in this, from this very pulpit before, John 6, 24 through 71, and in Matthew chapter 5 and 6, all these places. He's constantly doing that. Men are to be prophets, knowing, speaking, and living out God's word, um, which instructs us how to balance king priesting. What's good, what's bad, right? The profiteering, of course, is a pun on P-R-O-F-I-T, profiteering, uh, which is a way to enrich oneself, uh, you know, 
more, uh, momentarily by hook or crook, but profit, P-R-O-P-H-E-T, profiteering enriches you spiritually, king priesting and profiteering, okay? Uh, we are prophets. Say that with me. We are prophets. We are priests. We are kings. Let's bring it home. I am a prophet. I am a priest. I am a king. Just wanted you to remember that. Prophets and priests and kings. Like Jesus. Like Adam. Serve to rule. Guard to priest. Preach to prophet. Or something like that. Kings serve. Priests guard. Prophets preach. Okay. So king, priesting, and profiteering. But what about for, for the for hearth part? King, priesting, and profiteering for hearth. A hearth is technically the floor of a fireplace, uh, which the fireplace in the ancient and medieval homes of Europe and Britain and later America was the heart of the home. And yes, our word heart, by the way, is related through an old English word, hyor, uh, as our hearts, like a house's hearth, were considered the center of the body and the home. So when people say hearth nowadays, they're normally using it as a metaphor for the home. So hearth equals home, but I like the word hearth better, sue me. Uh, and this brings us back to the subject that this talk is supposed to be about, husbands, fathers, men, specifically. Now that we've laid out what our dominion, our dominical prophet, priest, and king aspects are generally for all genders and all ages, right, in Christ, now we turn to specific meanings of this for man, uh, to diversity from unity, just as I did with women's roles some weeks back in that series. It's deja vu all over again except backwards. Right? So I'm going to read to you now Genesis 2, 19 through 20. Out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the air and he brought them to Adam to see what he would call them. And whatever Adam called each living creature, that was its name. So Adam gave names to all cattle, to the birds of the air, and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper uh, comparable to him. And of course, the great prophet uh, Bob Dylan once wrote a song about this. God gave names to all the animals. I'm sorry, man gave them. Man gave names to all the animals. In the beginning, uh, some of you are old enough to remember that. Okay, so um, here we see in this passage, our boy Adam functioning uh, functioning uh, in these dominion tasks as prophet, priest, and king. He obeys and hears and lives out the word of God, which is the Lord's command that he named the creatures, all of whom were brought to him, likely a good day's work there, like a prophet should. And as a king, he creatively engaged in developing and glorifying and beautifying the creatures and thus the world itself by identifying specifying a word related to our word species, by the, by the way, thus supporting as a prophet and a king the recognition that God had created all these creatures as kinds, the word is mean in Hebrew, as kinds, which in its root means to portion out or to sort, relating each organism to other likes, which Adam thus solidifies creatively, and he develops in terms of subspecies, of differences within those species, a sort of a one in many expansion of definition so that each of the creatures has a defining name type which uh, last is a priestly function. Such naming reinforces the kind distinction and, the, and defines within those created boundaries. Okay, I know that was a lot that was off point, but you get the idea. But the exercise of man naming the animals was set up by God to make a point to further develop and glorify mankind himself, as Genesis 2, 18 and 21 through 24 tells us. And the Lord God said, it is not good that man should be alone. I will make a helper comparable to him. Now, folks, he said that before what we just read about, about Adam looking at the animals. 
So God knew what he was doing all along. Adam didn't know. But then it goes on to say, after he names all the animals and finds out there's not a helper for him, and the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall on Adam, and he slept, and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh in its place. Then the rib which the Lord God had taken from man, he made into a woman, to a woman. And he brought her to the man, and Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She should be called woman, because she was taken out of man. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. So Adam did realize that among all the creatures, and he saw and named every kind, according to verse 11, and found amongst them no helper. Uh, this word in Hebrew, Isaiah, it means very simply help, or one who helps, or one who aids. I realize that feminists hate the fact that this is how God characterized a woman in relation to a male mate, uh, and they resent that, but that's because they hate the fact that one of the ways a married woman displays dominion is precisely by putting aside her tashuka, which we talked about when I preached before, her fallen desire to dominate her husband, as we saw a few weeks ago in Genesis 3.16, and they value helping for both God's and her husband's sake. And we covered all that before. This is the other side of the coin. So God makes a helper, a fitting help, or help me, as King Jaime renders it, for Adam by causing him to go into a deep sleep. And by the word, that uh, Hebrew word, uh, tardema, uh, means trance. So he went into a trance, uh, and God took a rib from Adam's side. He made a woman, Eve, to be his helper, and they were to become one flesh, echad bashar, one flesh. Bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh, as Adam puts it. Now the early church correctly saw in all this a symbolic picture of Christ in the church, since after being pierced in his side by the executioner's spear, he fell into a three-day death swoon, and the church, uh, us, was born from what came out of Jesus' wounded side, his blood. Uh, and we too are intended to be one with him as his body, as the Bible says in Ephesians 5.30 and Colossians 1.24. This is all over the place in early Christian commentary on this. And Genesis 2, 23 through 24, is what underlies where the rubber meets the road about marriage, uh, kingly, priestly, and profiteeringly speaking. In Ephesians chapter 5, verses 20 through 23, which says, giving thanks always for all things to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another in the fear of God. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is head of the wife, as also Christ is head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as the Lord does the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh and of his bones. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let each one of you in particular so love his own wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. So verse 20, first uh, verse in this, uh, says, uh, giving thanks always for all things to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And folks, this teaches us that marriage, uh, like all things, is a gift from God for which we are to be thankful, even in a broken time such as we live at, which is to help inform us, this marriage is, into what God intends us to be. Verse 21 of that passage, submitting to one another in the fear of God, provides an overall context for marriage, valuing one another in light of God's word above ourselves, 
to submit, hupotasso is the word, a voluntary attitude of, of giving in or cooperating or assuming responsibility or carrying a burden to one another, generally speaking. Verse 22, wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. Ladies, take care who you marry. Be careful that your husband-to-be or husband-to-be is worth submitting to. Verses 23 through 24, if you're married, it's too late, so suck it up. Verses 23 through 24, what does it say? For the husband is the head of the wife, and also as also Christ is head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands and everything. So the husband is the head of the wife. Like Christ is the head of the church, and he's the savior of his body. And just like the church is to obey and follow Christ, um, wives are to do to their husbands in everything, in pos, it says in Greek, in all. Woo-hoo! Sounds rocking, right, guys? I mean, yeah, the women's have to submit. Okay. But then we go on to verses 25 through 27, right? Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word. This gives us further context for this. Husbands are supposed to love their wives like Jesus loves the church and gave himself for the church. You husbands are to value your wife as Christ did the church. He gave every nanosecond of his life to redeem the church, subjecting his desires, his actions, his aspirations to saving the church. All of which he sacrificed on the cross because he loved the church. Every second, every preference, every desire sacrificed for the good of his bride, which Revelation uh, 21 calls the church. Hmm. Not as excited then, husband, about being the head of the wife. Kind of a huge cost of time, energy, preference, and so forth, right? Why would you do such a thing? What is the purpose of that? Well, I'm happy you asked that question because verses 26 and 27 help us with that. That he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. So why would you do that? To sanctify, and that word means make holy, your wife, and cleanse her by the word so that she can be presented to God as, and the word is indoxos in Greek, means in gloried or in splendored, uh, beautified glorified, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, with no sin of disfiguring accoutrements or aspects, holy and without blemish. Yes, you may have realized by now, folks, that a husband and a father is a pastor. Welcome to my world, fathers and husbands, which is a difficult task. Why is it difficult? because I can't box some of you yahoos around the head to get you to study your Bible or stuff, right? All I can do is lead by example and urge you to do the right thing and rely on the Spirit. You, husband, are a king, and it's your responsibility to serve as a slave to be in, in glorifying your wife, to help her develop in sanctification, to make her a present for God. You, husband, are priest, and it is your responsibility to guard her from evil, including your own, including her own, and help keep her from being what she should not be. You, husband, are a prophet, and it is your responsibility to know how to enact these things by knowing, yes, knowing, and living out, and teaching the word of God to your wife because of love. Verses 28, so forth, and uh, 31. So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. 
He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it just as the Lord does the church. We're supposed to love our wives as ourselves. You're supposed to love your wife like yourself. Because, well, she is yourself. Verse 28, he who loves his wife loves himself. And the rest of this passage identifies not only husband and wife as one flesh, remember, which it does in verse 31, one flesh, the same, but also together we are members of Christ Jesus' body, right? Members one of another. And of course, that's the other part of the deal. Because verse 32, this is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Verse 32 says our marriages represent, preach, symbolize, present the picture of the Christ who gave himself totally for his bride, the church, and who is to be submitted to totally by the church. In light of this, in verse 33, Nevertheless, let each one of you in particular so love his own wife as himself and let the wife see that she respects her husband. God tells us that each husband should be sure to love his wife as himself and each wife be sure to respect her husband. Uh, guys, I, I have it on good authority that a husband who is sold out to serving his wife's betterment and guarding her well-being and doing so in terms of what God's word lays down because he loves his wife more than himself and wants to please the Lord above all, is an easy man to trust and submit to. You don't get a lot of grief from people if you're killing yourself on their behalf. But ladies, I can also tell you that a wife who is dedicated to bettering her husband, respecting and thus guarding him, and living to serve God in his word, fulfilling her calling to submit to him, to honor God, is an easy woman to love and give himself to. Surprising, isn't it? That selfishness is messing up the whole equation. The trick, you see, is to love and value each other more than you love yourself, and to love God more than anyone else. No problem, right? King, priesting, and profiteering. Right? Now in Ephesians 6, um, verses 1 through 4, it says this. Kids always love this. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise that it may be well with you and you may live long on the earth. And you fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the training and admonition of the Lord. More hearth, fathers. And kids, you are responsible to obey your parents. Your youthful boneheadedness is no excuse. Um, want to live a long time? Obey your folks. And yes, they brought you into this world and yes, they can take you out of it. But fathers, then there's verse 4. And you fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the training and admonition of the Lord. It says don't paragiso in Greek. Don't exasperate or provoke your kids to anger. Instead, raise them in the training. And that word uh, is a Greek word, paideia. It's a training and an education physically, mentally, and morally with rules and admonitions reproof and punishments, responsibilities and so forth. In other words, it's a training in how to live your whole life. So raise them in the uh, paideia and in the nutasia, which is exhortations, admonition, instruction of the Lord. In other words, train them to act and obey God uh, as Christians, as they should do. As a father and a husband, you have to say no sometimes because as a priest, you must guard your family against evil, even their own evil. But remember to number one, understand what the desires and the issues are in the situation. Don't just lazy it out. 
and do something you kind of think is a deal, but love them enough to actually figure out what's going on so that you can, number two, correctly and justly guard as a priest against true evil. Jesus said in John 7, 24, do not judge according to appearance, but judge with righteous judgment. So you can also correctly promote sanctification and growth as, you know, uh, a king function in your family. And so you can correctly assess as a prophet in light of what the Bible says about the value of things. This means not just blowing something off because it's a hassle or knee-jerking because you don't like it or because you want to uh, prefer yourself to your kids or your wife. But instead, number one, take the time to find out what the issue may be as it actually is. And number two, learn what the Bible teaches so you can be a godly prophet, priest, and king, serving your family as you should. And remember, Ephesians chapter 4, 15 through 16, speaking the truth in love, we may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ, from whom the whole body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies, according to the effective working by which every part does its share, causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. So this specifically tells us to speak the truth in love, to facilitate the glorification, the sanctification of each other, which includes our spouses and families, so that they can provide everything that is needed in the body of Christ, which includes your family, and so forth. Y'all, this is not a terrible thing to have to do, to have the responsibility of dominion as a prophet, priest, and king to your family and the world. As Jesus said in 1 John 5, 3, this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. So if you think it's too hard, I'll let you take that up with Jesus because he says you're a liar. To be what we were created to be is a privilege. It is not a burden. These things, these functions of what we are intended to do and be are meant to free us to be <clears throat> ourselves more sanctified and glorified. But we must love our families and our God, more than we love ourselves. We must value the things we're responsible for more than our comfort, more than our ease, more than our own agendas, desires, and interests. We must put aside our selfish gods and worship and obey the true God, our Creator and Redeemer. Oh, so you've got king preaching and profiteering for hearth. What about the last part? And country. We all know our nation is in trouble. We have problems. We allow 4,000 children a day to be slaughtered in the womb. We have a massive rise in sexual trafficking. Um, we devalue our money, our governmental theft, despite the fact that Scripture lays down just, uh, just uh, measures and so forth. We reward indigents with money. All these and other things despite clear biblical commands for nations to the contrary. I know most Christians don't, today don't think Scripture addresses civil government, but it is actually very specific about such things uh, if you bother to learn and understand it, and perhaps sometimes uh, in Sunday school somebody do a teaching on that. The same principles for marriage and family apply to our culture. Kings serve, priests guard, prophets preach, Say that with me. Kings serve. Prophets preach. Priests guard. If our nation is to be turned, folks, it'll be from the ground up. Prophets, priests, and kings of all ages, genders, and position glorifying their relationships, their environments, our institutions. But there is in all of this a cost of time, commitment, and will of love beyond ourselves for wife, family, nation, and God. And the question is always, always, will we do it? And time will tell. Folks, we all screw up all the time. 
We all screw up a lot. We all need to repent, right? All of us. If you're here and you're not a Christian, you should repent so that you can know life and freedom. If you're a Christian and you've been screwing up in some of these areas, we need to repent. We need to stop doing those things. We need to confess our sins and start to act as God wants us to. Not because uh, he's some overbearing tyrant who just wants us to do stuff because he just likes it that way. It's because doing that will make us what we are supposed to be and free us and our society and our families. He wants us to do those things because he loves us, not because he hates us. Right? But we have to love him and the things that we're in charge over more than we love ourselves. And that's the rub, is it not? To obey God in these things as prophet, priest, and king is to live. To give up and lose our lives for others, for others, is to live. Matthew 10, 39, Jesus says, And he who loses his life for my sake will find it. Find your life. Be the prophet, priest, and king that you are meant to be. King serve. Priest guard. Prophets preach. So happy early Independence Day to you. Let's pray. Blessed Father, we thank you that you speak to us clearly. We know that we don't hear you sometimes because we don't want to hear you. But I ask that uh, these men and women here, Lord, these families, this church, and even our nation, I ask that you would bring home the reality of your word and the fact that it is liberating and freeing and that you inhabit your words and that you call people to come to you. I ask that you would cause these words to haunt us through the days to come and that your spirit would use them to empower us to do the right thing. I ask all this for in Jesus' name.